Good afternoon, and on behalf of the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress, welcome to our discussion on the CHIPS Act. Um, what does it mean and what's next? I, I'm very proud um, to be part of this discussion, to, to provide a welcome and kick off a conversation, which I think is extremely well-timed and important. Um, as many of you know, the center has been studying geotechnology competition between the United States and China uh, for some time now. We have had some significant progress recently represented by uh, bipartisan consensus and work around the CHIPS Act and investment in domestic production of semiconductors. Um, that has significant implications for that technological competition. Uh, but we want to unpack exactly what those implications are. How far does it get us? What's left over um, from the larger legislation and the Innovation Act that was being considered that we might still see progress on? Um, where are areas where we may not see progress? And how does this impact this overall competitive situation uh, that we find ourselves in, which seems to be uh, moving forward consistently in terms of its urgency. Those of us who are watching developments in the uh, Indo-Pacific area, uh, I think have taken note recently of, um, you know, both the Chinese response to things like Speaker Pelosi's trip to Taiwan, but also the launching of the Indo-Pacific Economic Forum our framework, excuse me, discussions that included a significant pillar on supply chain resilience and security. Um, there is a lot of context around the idea of um, supply chains of, of semiconductor manufacturing, friendshoring, onshoring, and all the related components, um, a lot of issues overlapping. So I'm extremely excited that we are able to host this, this conversation I'm glad to be able to hand over momentarily to our senior vice president, Dan Mahaffey, to uh, introduce our panelists and then kick off uh, what I think will be a highly substantive discussion that I think may help us further understand how the CHIPS Act impacts these larger questions, what the limits of it might be, um, and, and what do we need to think about in terms of where we go from here. So with that, let me just say thank you to our, our participants for being here. Um, thank you to Andy, Andy Kaiser uh, for your role in shaping many of these conversations and uh, to Diane Ronaldo and, and Becky Frazier for um, being part of a, a consistent set of conversations around this and related issues. We really appreciate your perspective and viewpoints. So thanks for being back with us. Dan, let me turn it over to you um, from here to, uh, to get things rolling. Uh, thanks, Glenn, and thank you all for joining us. And it's a great panel we have here, a great group here joining us today. I'll quickly introduce them, and then we'll get to this, this conversation here. Uh, first, Becky Frazier is joining us from Qualcomm, the uh, Senior Director of Government Affairs. She engages with U.S. government agencies, works on international trade issues with the diplomatic corps, and engages with folks like us in think tanks and other academic organizations to uh, understand these issues and bring the private sector perspective from one of America's leading innovation companies. Uh, Diane Ronaldo joins us uh, from the Open RAN Policy uh, Coalition. She is one of the leading authorities on 5G, telecommunications, supply chain security, and privacy. She also served as the acting administrator of the NTIA, and the Acting Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Communications and Information. Uh, she also has a extensive experience on Capitol Hill, uh, working with the House uh, Committee on Intelligence, uh, and also an alumni uh, of the Mike Rogers uh, team, as is Andy Kaiser, our next panelist. Uh, he has had an extensive career on Capitol Hill, working on intelligence, telecommunications, national security issues, He's advised presidential transition teams on matters of national security and personnel for defense, homeland security, state, and justice departments. Um, he's also written extensively on geopolitical challenges. I've worked with him closely on two great semiconductor reports. If you can go to our publications page, uh, check them out. We presage many of the things we're going to discuss here today. Um, so I think that with that, I will actually turn to you, Andy, first for a little bit of 
you know, one, how we got here. We've we've recognized this challenge. Two, with your experience on Capitol Hill, this bipartisan agreement on it. That's not something we see every day on issues, but we were able to get this through. Um, and then from there, what what is the impact that we're going to see from this legislation? Sure. Thanks so much, Dan. Nice to be on on with you and and Diane and Becky. Always nice to uh, engage in a thoughtful conversation on something that really impacts everybody, right? From from the iPhone in, in your pocket to the uh, airplanes I just heard flying over our off, uh, office here in Chinatown, uh, here in DC. Um, you know, and I think in recent years, the importance of chips have really uh, become clear to folks. Uh, you know, you had auto plants idling because we couldn't get enough uh, uh, chips. You have, uh, as, as Congressman Nye mentioned, the increased potential uh, 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 conflict across the Taiwan Strait and what that might mean for the world. So I do think, you know, the sense in the last couple of years uh, beyond sort of the tech and national security geeks uh, like all of us, uh, <laughs> at least myself uh, and Dan, like all of us, um, you know, I do think it's had this broader uh, sense of, of, the, of the importance. Obviously with the COVID situation, uh, countries around the world um, became, it became more and more apparent that, that, you know, relying on, frankly, our geo, you know, one of our primary geopolitical adversaries in the world for key supplies was not particularly wise. So I think you're seeing a lot of uh, countries around the world, including the United States, look at those supply chains, you know, try to understand what a potential disruption looked like, could look like, try to understand how a, a country might as we've discussed uh, in our uh, previous report stand here at the center, how China might use technology in the same way that Russia uses oil and gas um, as, as a, a blood and leverage point, obviously taking place right now um, uh, across Europe. So looking at all of that, uh, pretty clear that it's, it's a top of mind issue. Uh, the CHIPS Act has, has uh, been going on for a number of years. Uh, Becky, I'm sure has, uh, has the, the bumps and bruises from a lot of those fights uh, first getting authorized uh, in the NDAA a couple of years ago, which was a great achievement, but of course, uh, uh, to really confuse people, contains no, no real dollars. So that, that became the real fight of, of getting that turned into, uh, into real, real money that could go out and, and help uh, companies like Qualcomm and other chip makers, um, you know, site site manufacturing, frankly, here in the United States, where, um, you know, you have all the economic uh, uh, arguments for, for why that's important, but particularly for the national security community, uh, why securing that supply chain was, was awfully important. And of course, $52 billion is, is a lot of money, a very important step, but just a drop in the bucket as to, as to probably what's, what's needed. Um, one interesting thing is, of course, the United States is not uh, on an island. Uh, the rest of the world is grappling with all of these issues as well. And we've had close collaboration at the center with uh, folks in the Japanese government, uh, in South Korea, um, in the EU, uh, who has uh, initiated some similar uh, type activities. Japan, South Korea actually has a huge uh, chip incentive program. Obviously they have a big domestic champion in Samsung there. Uh, but you're seeing a lot of these countries grapple with this um, in the in the security space. We've seen it in NATO. We've seen it uh, in in the Quad, which I think is really important to include our Japanese allies, as they have a, a great deal of expertise uh, in this space, and as well as as in India. Not just an important uh, you know potential trading partner there, an important geo geostrategic ally in the Indo Pacific uh, as as a potential check on China. Um, and as a country that has engaged live fire with the Chinese military along its border uh, in recent years, one that is is also very concerned about where those where those conversations are going and where you know potential reliance uh, on China might lead them. Um, and I think all a great deal of concern. But I guess to to answer the uh, the question that you posed in the name of of the panel, I think we're just getting started. Thank you, Andy. Yes, that's a, a good point that we are sort of in the initial phases here. We've seen the administration lay out its uh, implementation strategy. 
Um, you know, 28 billion of uh, investment in the leading edge manufacturing. We talk a lot about that, of course, the, you know, the cutting edge, the seven, five, uh, really, really tiny stuff that's the cutting edge. But, you know, they also, the administration is emphasizing the mature and current generation chips, the, the 10 billion in, in funding for that, for more of the legacy nodes. And Andy, as you talked, you, you mentioned the importance of those uh, chips we've seen. Are those the ones that we see that are so important for defense, for cars, that even though there's the cutting edge, there's still that important emphasis on the, for lack of a better term, bread and butter chips? I think that's right. And I think you, you saw that again, with, just to use the example of, of the auto industry, where, you know, a, a, a chip that costs, you know, something like less than a dollar, 58 cents or something, um, you know, the, the fact that they couldn't get those those uh, supplies in, in their real time manufacturing process, uh, you could see what kind of an impact that could have uh, just as a critical national security commodity. So you're right, the stuff we that keeps national security policymakers up at night is, is the leading edge uh, uh, chips that are frankly almost exclusively made in Taiwan. Um, and and so that's clearly an imperative, but the whole the whole supply chain becomes a critical uh, national security commodity that that folks are are worried about from from top to bottom because the truth is that an F thirty five has those but it also has uh, lots of basic chips that if that it can't get access to those or if they're compromised in some way um, that creates a, a real potential threat mm -hmm. uh, which we've just seen in the news with the stand down of some F thirty fives over uh, supply chain concerns we have we have uh, yes and we've seen. Also this week, uh, what, uh, the FT, the Financial Times in London reported that uh, some YMTC chips from China um, had had made its way into Huawei gear uh, in likely direct subver subversion of US sanctions laws. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's a very delicate supply to these very small, uh, <laughs> very small, but very important uh, mm -hmm. uh, components to, to the global economy, no mm -hmm. question. I think that's a, a good segue on the issue of the different, uh, you know, different semiconductors and the importance of different types um, to, to talk to Becky now about the, you know, how this legislation one addresses those differences we've talked about between advanced uh, and more mature uh, semiconductor technology, but for you all as well, how this answers some of that challenge of bringing technology from the, as they say, from the lab to the fab. Uh, and how does this promote that uh, process? Thank you, Dan. I appreciate you convening today's panel um, of thoughts. I look forward to this discussion. You know, as the world's largest fabulous semiconductor company, Qualcomm was hugely supportive of the Chips and Science Act, um, in part because, um, you know, seeing the um, the opportunity to onshore uh, expanded semiconductor capacity is good for the semiconductor ecosystem and it's good for um, all of the users of semiconductors, which as Andy mentioned, is really um, uh, runs the gamut of just about every economic sector of the US economy. And seeing as, um, the number of chips that we uh, need in our economy and that we will continue to need um, that expanded capacity at both the leading edge and the feature rich mature node um, uh, segment uh, are really important. And so, you know, the legislation um, was fairly broad in terms of the, uh, the grant um, allocation. And I think that that, uh, that did provide an opportunity for the Commerce Department to, to do a very thoughtful analysis um, through several years of, uh, of mapping of the semiconductor supply chain and really understand more about the sector and then uh, facilitated them to move quickly on announcing their strategic plan, which they did a number of weeks ago um, to, to start to signal how they um, intend to, to spend part of that um, grant money uh, and the R&D funding. You know, but really, as we look at the importance of onshoring, you know, it's it's important to keep in mind that the semiconductor 
uh, market continues to grow. So as we saw in 2021, the worldwide semiconductor sales were about 556 billion, was a 26% increase from 2020 sales. The market's expected to grow another 13% on top of that in 2022. And the market is forecast to continue to grow into 2023. So as more segments of the economy use semiconductors, we need more capacity across the board at all nodes in order to supply a very wide range of customers. Yes, yeah, sort of a uh, all of the above answer in some ways. We, with you see this growth and the importance of this, you you can't pick one over the other. And it looks like the administration has taken some of that leeway to, to balance it out more. Um, although I will now move on to one thing where Congress was very specific about their intent was to support the development of new telecommunications technologies, specifically allocating uh, $1.5 billion to open RAN, software-based, the, the next generation of 5G, and the foundation of what we hope will be 6G technology. Um, so I think that's a perfect segue to, to Diane, because these topics of supply chain security, um, we've been talking about them, you know, all the way since the Huawei report, kind of the uh, before it was cool to be talking about uh, supply chains. Now it's it's everywhere, but we're really maturing and specifically moving ahead on these areas of open RAN and something I, I would like to uh, learn more about. Thanks, Dan. And I will say that supply chain has always been cool. Um, in our in our neck of the world. So, um, but you're right. The politicians and policymakers have been discussing this for about ten years now with the release of the Wawer report. Um, but in the past couple of years, especially as the run up to five G, the uh, policymakers have started asking the question: If not them, then who? It's not enough to remove players, especially when there's only a handful of um, RAM manufacturers around the world. Um, how are we going to fill that void? How are we going to ensure that we have enough supply to build out not only the United States, but the developing world as well, who begun um, several years ago? And as we see now, the uh, more developed, the um, developing world is starting to catch up and they're building out their needs as well through 4G, 5G. Um, so the idea of open RAN is to that you disaggregate the RAN. So the radio access network, which sits on the cell phone tower. So can, as you can imagine, it is the most expensive component of building out a network. Every time you have a cell tower, every company has their own piece of equipment on that tower. You have to hire, hire very talented um, individuals to climb up the tower, uh, make sure that the equipment is securely fastened um, and calibrated. It is incredibly time consuming and this is why it usually takes a little life cycle of 10 years. So with open RAN, the idea is that you are um, you are disaggregating the RAN. So now that you're breaking it up into more of a Lego system, so the software, hardware, radio it can all be interchangeable. So no longer are you picking one company and going with that product. You can choose which type of software, hardware, radio. Um, so you can build out the network that best suits your needs for any individual. Uh, area, you know, as you can imagine, right, the needs of New York City are looking a lot different than my hometown of Rumford, Maine, uh, population 5,000. So Open RAN, um, when I was at NTI, it was the first time I heard about the concept of Open RAN, and that was when Rakuten started building out their nationwide network in Japan. And so I would say that when we came together, um, and Becky is also a member, not only is Qualcomm a member, Becky is on the executive committee and uh, on the board. So we have been working closely since day one on this. So when we came together, it was originally to be able to articulate to policymakers, including Senator Warner, who introduced the USA Telecom Act, which created two new grant programs on how open RAN would impact um, the private sector community. You know, what started as originally four companies at two weeks before we launched, we're at 11. Um, the day we launched, we're at 31, and we have now over 60 global companies. What we quickly realized, this was not a problem, just the U.S. was having um, you know, the developed world all around the country, all around the world, excuse me, are de uh, dealing with the same exact issues as us. And what we've been focusing on in the past year and a half is um, the, the developing world who's looking at their next build 
and what they're going to use um, in their networks. So again, there are a lot of people looking at the security side of this point at the coalition. We look at the economic side and the innovation that's within that if we are able to break open the random to really drive competition at the subcomponent level. Um, and we've already seen an explosion of industries, small business that have stepped up and are innovating in this space. So it's been a, it's been a great two and a half years to watch this industry transform um, the telecommunications sector. And uh, it, you know, it's there was an article recently released um, on light reading by Del Del Oro. Uh, they did a report that said that Open RAN is actually smashing um, expectations on sales over the past year. So it's great to have some uh, confirmation that mm. um, Open RAN is not only um, you know just a policy conversation that carriers are looking to put it in their networks because they view it as the next wave of innovation. Becky, as uh, a member of this coalition and, and one of the key innovators in this, how does this help you on the R&D side, seeing this support, not just for specifically open RAN, but the other elements of this bill that look at R&D and those, those future innovations? Um, great question. So certainly as we look at the Public Wireless Fund and a number of the uh, semiconductor R&D programs that were appropriated, there is a real opportunity to, um, to invest in strategic sectors that the U.S. sees as uh, important to sustain a competitive edge. And certainly telecommunications will be a part of that, um, you know, open ran into 6G, um, but but also in terms of as we look at the 11 billion um, R&D and the chips segment of the legislation, uh, you know, a number of the new programs that will be set up, the National Semiconductor Technology Center, the Advanced Packaging Institute, um, and some of the other, uh, many, the USA Manufacturing Institute, these are really important mechanisms to bring public and private sector together to focus on pre-competitive research that can really make a difference in, um, in the ultimate competitiveness of the semiconductor ecosystem at a wide range of segments. And uh, just this week, the President's Council of Advisors on Science Te and Technology, the PCAST, put out their report on revitalizing the US semiconductor ecosystem. And they, um, they spent uh, a large portion of that report really looking at the recommendations as to what the National Semiconductor Technology Center, and potentially the advanced packaging, that 11 billion in R&D, really where it could move the needle. Um, and I think that this is um, a really in-depth uh, examination of the current state of the U.S. semiconductor R&D investments and where uh, targeted uh, capital flows could could make a difference going forward. So I think that that report is um, is good reading material for everyone who's interested in in how that eleven billion gets mm -hmm. uh, spent. Does it do enough to get the product from R and D scaled to that commercial step we need to see where we can really unlock? As we talk so much about the the first mover advantages, is there more that can be done, or how did this do there? So. Um, you know, I think that as, so the short answer is to be determined, um, the mm -hmm. National Semiconductor Technology Council, the Advanced Packaging Institute, um, and some of the other programs uh, will take shape uh, going forward. So that's in part, there's be an advisory council that is established to help shape some of that. And then a number of conversations with NIST really at the epicenter to, to determine uh, how some of these um, funds get allocated. Um, you know, in order to really um, move from, you know, lab to fab, it, it really does take um, a, a significant investment in our sector. Um, you know, really when you look at um, what it takes to get a semiconductor from from computer to uh, to tape out, you're you're looking at at a very heavy investment of capital, um, and and I do think that that is why you have seen 
um, a number of companies from across the ecosystem, right? The design, the tools, the materials, and the fabs all coming together to have this conversation around where will targeted dollars really make a difference. Um, and, you know, we are seeing um, some coalescing around, you know, really building out a network. Again, public participation, um, the public sector, private companies, academics, um, really focused on uh, where to make a difference in terms of, you know, potentially next generation chiplet system on a chip, a number of areas as to really potentially that could make a difference, I think, um, you know, we'll see in the coming months. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point that we're, we're seeing the implementation of this now, but we also note to the the other countries moving at the same time. We're not alone in this. Um, and Diane, I'm, I'm gonna ask from your experience in the Department of Commerce, this is a big package moving through there. How can we help uh, an agency like Commerce uh, as outside advisors in the think tank community, those working in the private sector, do you, how can an agency move with a mission like this, uh, a new mission in some ways? Very carefully. Um, just to put it in perspective, the Department of Commerce is an agency with 12 different bureaus. It, bureaus that have pretty much nothing to do with one another. It's kind of a hodgepodge of not sure where, you know, where do you put NOAA? So let's put it in Commerce with NTIA and NIST. Um, so the, that total budget's 10 billion. In the past year and a half, they've received $48 billion to my old agency for broadband build out at NTIA. Um, another 1.5 for open RAN to NTIA, 52 billion for chips, and then NOAA was reauthorized and it was around $10 billion they've, re they've received. So in the course of uh, a year and a half, they've you know, increased, their, um, increased their budget pretty significantly. Uh, so I will say them, I hear wonderful things about the secretary um, from my former colleagues. She is incredibly engaged. She is bringing in the right people. Um, she's leveraging, you know, what, what the government currently has to offer. And then when, you know, reaches a wall, we'll go back out into the community and see where she can pull talent to bring them in. And, and my own agency, they've done a great job of hiring up to be prepared for the broadband program. But for the CHIPS program, there's an, an incredible amount of pressure from the White House, from Congress. There's going to be a lot of oversight in how this money is deployed. Um, with the original passage of the authorizing language, it did give them some parameters. So they have been looking at exactly how this program um, should be set up in the guidance, which we've seen recently released. Um, I would say for the open RAN program, it was pretty open-ended. So NTIA will have a lot of leeway determining how that money is spent. Um, but that, because of the way that was structured, they had no ability to begin standing up the office. And so once that was appropriated with uh, President Biden signing the CHIPS Act several weeks ago, only then were they allowed to, to get the program up and running. Um, so I know there will continue to be a tremendous amount of oversight from Congress. You know, Andy and I used to work for an, an uh, oversight um, agency. You know, there's going to be um, expectations on how quickly this money goes out, especially from the private sector who you know, is eager to get this money to work, especially with pressures around the world on continued issues with global supply chain and geopolitical concerns. Um, there's a lot of different levers that are gonna need to be pulled in order to uh, get this out the door in the next uh, year or so. But Becky probably would have a better idea on timing with the chip side. Um, but NTI, I would say, has a little bit more flexibility on their end um, to get the money out the door probably in the next six months. Yeah, Becky, how are you feeling on the on the timing on this? You know, I um, I, I think that the Department of Commerce has really done um, uh, an excellent job of moving swiftly and strategically um, in terms of the you know from when the legislation was signed to the executive order to the strategy that was released on September sixth. Um, and again, as, as Diane had noted, the, the emphasis on building the system within the US mm -hmm. government that is um, professionally 
ready to implement this program. Uh, you know, the September 6th strategy did send a very ambitious target of um, starting to uh, receive applications uh, in early February 2023, so within six months, with awards and loans being made on a rolling basis. Um, so that is an exceptionally fast timeline. And uh, and again, I think that the way that uh, the interagency has you know been um, really starting to look at the um, the, the talent and the systems and the information needed in order to uh, implement this program with maximum um, impact on fab capacity and on stimulating workforce development mm -hmm. and the overall ecosystem that will be needed in order to really ensure that the initial investment of the CHIPS Act has the supporting scaffolding that's needed in order to achieve success. Thank you. Andy, one of the things we've often talked about is, and you know, building on this conversation we're having about building it and implementing it, the, the need to avoid the temptation to out China China. And what we've seen in this legislation, I think, is a, a goal where the government can work with the private sector to encourage new investment and move private capital along in ways rather than just simply like the Chinese having a, a government fire hose at that. How does that continue to, one, you know, how do we continue to promote that different model, avoid that temptation to out China China as we do oversight and, and follow on legislation? And how does that compare to some of the other models we're seeing, uh, you know, look at the Chinese? Is, is the money that we're putting forward a uh, competitive or a drop in the bucket compared to what they're doing still? Yeah, well, I think the good news on that is, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone in, in private industry or folks who track this for a living uh, think the United States needs to match China, the Chinese government support anyway, dollar for dollar by any means. You know, we still, our, our companies and our, our private sector, um, you know, bring incredible innovation. Um, and particularly in the West, I think there's a, a predisposition to to want to keep those jobs, that business, that technology, the innovation there. So I think you start with that uh, uh, predicate and and you you build from there. As far as uh, essentially, I think what you're asking me about is, is industrial policy. Essentially, um, how do we feel about that and as a free market uh, economy here? I do think folks who uh, overemphasize those, con those concerns, in my personal view, um, are, are misunderstanding the, China, the level of support from the Chinese government that, the, that the, uh, the Western companies are competing against. So it's not just you know, some research money here or there or an endless line of credit from the Bank of China, which we see with, with uh, competitors to, to uh, Western technology companies. It's on the front end, uh, state-sponsored espionage to gather intellectual property. It's uh, what they can't steal, they sometimes will purchase uh, through legal means uh, via joint venture, via um, you know, sometimes um, you know, hostile takeover, merger acquisition, go on down the line. There are a multitude of ways for the government to support acquisition of, of key technologies around the world. Um, then they bring that technology back. They tend to have a captured market in China with the world's, uh, you know, what's I think just largest or second largest population in the world. Um, and, and having a captured market there, sometimes let's say 90% of, of uh, domestic business has to go to Chinese uh, domestic companies. So captured market, captured, uh, uh, business, tremendous state support, state R&D support, uh, endless lines of credit. I mean, these are things we just don't find in the West. Uh, clearly, some of that is the, the, the different models in which we operate. But um, surely offering incentives for uh, folks to, to reshore, nearshore, ally shore uh, makes a lot of sense to just try to level that competitive playing field so we can win um, in, in a free market open competition where uh, I do think we all have to be entered this competition with our eyes open that one side 
doesn't have a finger on the scale, maybe a thumb, a fist, a leg. <laughs> um, and that's that's the level of competition. If you don't see it that way, I think you're missing a really important component. Uh, thank, thank you, Andy, for, for laying that out. And it is a good segue to one of the questions we have from our audience here. And I'm going to start to weave those into our discussion. So please do feel free to use the Q&A function uh, that we have here in Zoom to, to send us some questions. Uh, but the, the question is, is straightforward. How much does this legislation really move the needle when it comes to dependence on China for critical technologies uh, or dependence on imports for Taiwan, uh, excuse me, from Taiwan for these semiconductors? Uh, Becky, from, from your perspective and maybe Andy, from our security perspective? Um. So uh, I would uh, I would say that the Chips Act is uh, a great first step in um, diversification of the semiconductor supply chain to expand capacity that we can anticipate uh, we will likely need um, going forward at both the leading edge and the legacy capacity. The fact of the matter is that the semiconductor sector is a very capital intense sector and the amount of investment that is needed um, across the semiconductor value chain is, um, you know, very, very few other sectors have that type of uh, capital investment requirement. So um, I think that the 52 billion in chips uh, is is a concrete first step at acknowledging the current state of the value chain. Um, I think you know to the exact question around critical minerals and materials. You know I think that that's a conversation that is is going to continue um, in terms of the the potential opportunities to look at government levers to stimulate new upstream downstream partnerships to onshore more of that um, and find ways to use some of the CHIPS Act money as some seed money to attract resiliency across the whole ecosystem. So it's a good first step but um, based on the complexity of the ecosystem for semiconductors, um, you know, it, it, there will continue to be a global semiconductor value chain, and that is where the U.S. has um, U.S. companies have succeeded in the past. It's what we want to see is a continued global value chain with a more resilient, stronger U.S. position in that chain. So it's um, it is uh, a a very comprehensive, thoughtful first step. And we look forward to the conversations as to what the implementation looks like and what additional um, next steps, again, to support the success of the CHIPS Act, uh, largely from a workforce um, standpoint and uh, from a uh, design standpoint, in addition to the materials and minerals standpoint and, and the various inputs needed along the way. So look forward to Andy's perspective. Completely agree. Couldn't agree more. Um, and some of those critical materials or components are, are literally only available in China. Uh, and so it's it's not just the big fancy fab where someone will come and, and do a, a ribbon cutting, which is which yeah. is cool. Uh, but it's also those other things that are that are less cool but are are almost as as critical. Um, as far as the the actual uh, impact on the industry, I think it's as much a market signal, right? So, um, you, you know, since the announcement, even before it was signed, you've had major uh, uh, chip makers, Intel, TSMC, Micron make major multi-billion dollar announcements, I'm sure Qualcomm, but I don't want to speak for, for Becky, we'll let her, her speak there as well. Uh, those are the ones that, that come to mind um, that I'm familiar with in, in recent months. Um, and I think that was as much, again, a lot of those announcements were made prior to the legislation actually being signed into law. It was that that market signal that the United States government, key state governments um, are going to be partners in this endeavor. And, and building a fab is 
uh, very complicated, extraordinarily expensive, requires lots of inputs. Uh, Becky highlighted some of them, including, um, including sort of human capital, uh, raw materials, water. I mean, you know, very key components that end up being requiring state, local, federal uh, support, cooperation. And I think just just the idea that you know the United States Congress in this in this polarized time came together and initiated this pretty uh, expansive program in a, in an, in an industry sends that signal to the world that hey we're we're open for business. And again, I really don't think it needs to be dollar for dollar. It's not it's certainly not. Uh, I've I've read reports. It's you know maybe as much as as or as little as one sixth uh, that might be needed. Um, but uh, certainly pointed in the right directions. These programs have a way of taking a life of, of their own and perhaps being extended or expanded in future years. Uh, but just sending that market signal, I do think was, was very important. Uh, Diane, for the uh, open RAN field, uh, does this move up that time frame? Are they are similar time frames? You've talked about the, the sales growth, but is this uh, helping to accelerate as we as we look at this impact. Absolutely, you know we are obviously a much smaller dollar figure at 1.5 billion, but what we've seen in the telecommunications industry over the past 20 years is there just hasn't been that um, many new entrants because the barrier for entry has been so high. You know, if you were an engineer and you had a great idea for a new radio, you could only go to a handful of RAND manufacturers to sell them on your idea of a radio. You have to deal with the 10 year life cycle. Right. Would you really put all your eggs in the basket or would you look at some other industry to help innovate in? Now, when we're breaking down barriers in Europe, you can innovate and go directly to a carrier. We're doing private networks. Um, it gives you a lot more opportunities. We've seen a lot more growth. So this money is really going to help the smaller businesses that are trying to get set up. They're trying to go to standards bodies, get R&D. It will also help the larger companies as well as they look to help pivot their business from the current model that we've been um, working in and around for the past 20, 30, 40 years to a more open solutions. So it, it, it will make a difference. Um, and again, it's first steps, It's um, but it will help impact bringing open brand to scale. One of the audience questions I have here, I know we've talked a lot about semiconductors here, but it is from the audience, a question about the inclusion of NASA authorization in this. and. I, you know, I don't think in the specifics of this, but, you know, understanding one, that it was a, a piece of, uh, you know, innovation legislation. So it seemed a, a natural positive message, but to those of you with Hill experience, of course, the matters of horse trading and log rolling and, and putting together legislative packages, uh, is there anything else uh, worth noting in that or that, sh that we should consider as lessons for, for future innovation legislation or uh, just the unique nature of this Chips and Science Act. Uh, Diane? I'm happy. Yeah, so I would say that it's incredibly hard to get legislation signed into law. And so when something's moving, everybody wants to uh, you know, grab a ride on it. Um, I would say the Science Committee had um, very influential in the crafting of the CHIPS bill, and that in, uh, NASA authorization is out of the Science Committee. And so it probably gave them an opportunity to combine multiple uh, pieces of, of legislation into one package that um, was certainly going to move. Well, I think uh, you and you and Andy both know the the challenges of getting legislation passed and and how you take what opportunities you can and and what vehicles you well, can. One key I noticed, Dan, is is the the twenty uh, technology hubs. So that's that's always a good one for members because it's 20, uh, 20 states where they could be located potentially. Well, that's a, you know, that is a question here in the legislation is it, it is that opportunity to balance building out, you know, new opportunities, but not forgetting where we already have uh, existing strengths and uh, communities that have already demonstrated that there's a, a workforce and innovation ecosystem in place. It's it's great to build those elsewhere, but you don't want to do it at the expense of the, the strengths we already have. Um, but also, uh, you know, legislation is trade-offs. And I think as we as we get to the final uh, quarter hour here, the the questions of you know what wasn't in there, 
Um, you know, what could have been in there? You know, there were some proposals we talked about that didn't quite make it. Um, there could be follow on legislation for the new Congress. We'll, we'll be agnostic to the shape the Congress takes. But what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of things would you like to see in, in legislation going forward? Andy, I know you, you've talked about uh, YMTC and, and securing our technologies. So I'll, I'll start with you and then uh, Becky, your perspectives from industry. Yeah, I can I can be the the hammer and uh, let the others be uh, or be the uh, the stick and they can be the carrot. Um, yeah, I, you know I I do think one of the trade offs was um, there isn't a whole lot in there cracking further cracking down on on um, Chinese chip giants uh, or those who seek to be giants who are um, who are doing business with the the PLA the Chinese People's Liberation Army and. Uh, supplying uh, that military again, a, a key geopolitical adversary of the United States. Um, so, th you know, that was left out, um, underst understandably, as these negotiations go on. But now there's there is a lot more evidence about the direct tie uh, to the Chinese government from some of these uh, chip makers. Obviously, a couple like SMIC and um, High Silica, who makes uh, who supplies Huawei directly with their chips, had already been. Uh, added to the entity list under under the previous administration, uh, so that those issues can always be tackled later. They did fall off. Actually, if you saw uh, some of the press conferences uh, towards the end, became less about a Chinese competitiveness and more sort of U.S. supporting U.S. science and industry, which which is is completely fine. But as as more of a national security person, um, would be looking to for those next steps at at Diane's old shop at. Uh, at Commerce, uh, which typically falls uh, under the, the Bureau of Industry and Security, where there are things like uh, emerging technology rulemaking pending. Um, obviously, they could consider at any time adding uh, any of those Chinese chip makers to the entity list, including CXMT. Um, the idea that memory is, is a critical national security uh, uh, commodity is, is I think, uh, where, where folks are, are looking next. Thanks. And um, as we look at, you know, a number of the main segments of what was in, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it was comprehensive. When you look at the grant program, the strong R&D investment, um, the open RAN funding, the ITC for manufacturing, um, what didn't make it in was um, tax incentives for the design segment. So in the semiconductor ecosystem, many of us in the fabless, the R&D, the design portion of the ecosystem make substantial investments to continue the leading edge advances in semiconductors and continuing to drive us to smaller uh, nodes using less energy and more capacity. Um, and this is where the US has a competitive advantage. And um, we, as the fabulous companies, we take our designs and we are the customers to the pure play foundries. Um, so the manufacturers who will be expanding their investment in the United States, um, in part, uh, their investment decisions will depend on the orders placed by their customers, um, which include the fabulous um, semiconductor ecosystem of which Qualcomm is, is the largest. So looking as the United States uh, Congress and those of us who care passionately about the competitiveness of the semiconductor sector, look at the chips investment in manufacturing capacity and expanding that in the United States, also looking at what facilitates a competitive manufacturing position, and that will be a competitive design companies um, with large volume orders who continue to invest heavily in leading edge innovations. So um, looking at the opportunities to continue to position the US for success across the entire semiconductor ecosystem, um, including, you know, the R&D, the design, the tools, the software, uh, the manufacturing, and the, the packaging. And Diana, I, I promise I'll get to you next on, on what's next, but uh, Becky, what else do we need to on workforce? 
what can policymakers do on on workforce to support all this? Because that also seems to be, uh, from what I hear constantly, the, a challenge as well. And and how is this going to help there? And what more can be done? So. Um... You know, continuing to grow the talent pipeline in the United States for, um, for again, jobs across the entire ecosystem, you know, um, in order to ensure that we have the talent to work in the fabs that will hopefully come online in the next two to five years, um, cultivating a workforce that is um, trade focused and engineering focused. Um, those jobs, I mean, those those fabs will need, um, you know, they will need uh, a diverse set of jobs and a number of us in the semiconductor ecosystem are partnering with a number of academic institutions across the country to grow semiconductor um, engineering programs at master's PhD level because we see the trend lines um, in terms of the availability of the talent that we need. And there really isn't as natural a draw on university campuses to do the hard math and science of going into the semiconductor sector. Um, there, there is draws to other segments of the tech sector um, that, that tend to attract uh, students in larger numbers. So we, we need to do more to, to um, recruit, to educate and to recruit. So um, all of us telling our story more as to what we're doing to attract that talent and working with the US government to ensure that there are additional supporting programs, um, including the R&D investments, right? So when the NSF money goes to fund a chair at an academic institution, that then provides an opportunity for postdocs, which you know that, that's where uh, semiconductor companies will will sponsor programs and and ultimately will find our workforce of the future. So it's it's we need to be doing more to um, to find the pathway between academic collaborations, public investment, what the private sector is already doing, and identify really where we need to cultivate talent most critically to sustain the current position that we have in the ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, Diane, what, what more can be done in, in for your areas of uh, UC is important? No, that's a great question. Um, so our main goal is to bring open RAN to scale, and we're not going to do that in this country alone. We really do need to look to the international community. The U.S. government has many tools already in place, and but some companies just see them as unworkable, too much red tape, um, too much bureaucracy around our international assistance programs. And so if I had a magic wand, um, I would pull together a group of companies in the government to figure out how to make these tools that are already in existence workable. How are we going to be able to get to our goal? And what can the U.S. government do to tweak to make things easier for U.S. companies, um, as well as the foreign companies that are based in the U.S. also have the opportunities to access some of these programs? How can we ensure that that money is flowing in the right direction? We're putting it to good use. Thanks, Diane. Uh, final question I, before we take a break between panels, I, I will say we're coming on an election year. You know, things get heated in this time, but Diane and Andy, you've had experience shepherding bipartisan legislation. This came through as bipartisan legislation. Uh, Becky, you've you've worked with folks on both sides of the, the aisle discussing these issues. Um, and also too, working with, you know, members of industry have worked together that, you know, companies that may not always see eye to eye are still collaborating on the importance of issues of national importance. How do we maintain that spirit going forward on these issues, keeping that perspective on the, these topics of innovation leadership and ensuring our advantages in these uh, critical technologies? Uh, Diane, please. That's great. Um, I was incredibly fortunate to work for um, Chairman Mike Rogers and Dutch Ruppersberger. Um, last time I saw Dutch, he told me that, that I was one of his staffers too. Um, so we were incredibly lucky to see a process that was functioning um, and it allowed us to do really great work. Um, it is heartening as um, to work through on Open RAN to uh, be able to work with both sides of the aisle, have uh, Senate 
come together with the House of Representatives um, and the White House to get this done. Um, you know, there's this is pretty nonpartisan. Um, and so it's great to see that there is still agreement on both sides of the aisle on these tough issues and people are willing to come to the table and do what counts. Um, I would say that there's still a lot of excitement around innovation that is out there and, and getting people excited about helping support that innovation. You know, it, everyone likes to be able to champion um, a good cause. And this, we, we've certainly built a good story um, based on all the great work that, that my member companies are doing and helping advance communications. And as we move to the digital of everything, um, you know, the level of knowledge, um, not only in Congress, but as well as kind of the general public has greatly increased since I started working um, for Andy Kaiser uh, 15, 13 years ago, Andy, it's been a long time. Um, so yeah, it, it's good to see. Andy? Uh, yeah, so, you know, I think this is an area, one of the few where there, there is and can be uh, bipartisan, nonpartisan, even agreement. Um, you know, I think sort of our, our geopolitical position uh, in the world, given, you know, recently what's happened in, in, in Ukraine in particular, uh, unites, you know, the majority of, of the Congress on both sides uh, of the aisle. You see, um, you know, some folks on, on either end who don't always subscribe to, to those views, but that along with global U.S. competitiveness, I do feel like are sort of non, non-partisan issues. We are losing some really awesome uh, champions, though, in, in some of these areas. I think of people like Rob Portman from Ohio, who who are very difficult to replace. Uh, there are good people uh, behind them. A lot of the leadership of, of the CHIPS Act, the original CHIPS Act, of course, uh, are, are coming are coming back, which is great. Congressman McCall, Senator Cornyn, uh, on down the line, Senator Schumer, of course. Um, so you do have that that cadre every every cycle. Uh, Diane and I have been around longer than we like to admit. So every cycle you lose some friends, but you, you do pick up some new ones. And I've been able to meet a, a, a number of candidates coming in and. Um, you know, there are some uh, some folks that are a little more, uh, let's say, interesting and colorful than uh, than maybe any of us would like in the Congress. But there are some really darn impressive people that show up to this place, too, and, and try to do the right thing for the country. Becky? I would just round it out by... Um... By acknowledging the environment with which the Chips and Science Act passed, which is a, was an unprecedented semiconductor supply chain constraint, um, and how that reality touched companies of different sizes across the entire country in a multitude of sectors. You know, the Semiconductor Industry Association did a letter of support of the legislation um, in the weeks before it passed, and they had over a hundred. Um, major executive signing on in support of this type of legislation from such a wide range of companies, right? So I think um, continuing to acknowledge how semiconductors and Open RAN and some of these emerging technologies will be instrumental to companies of a wide range of sizes. They will be foundational to those companies' success in every state. Um, and ensuring that we um, successfully move past the supply constraint, but don't lose the lessons that we learned um, in the heat of that black swan moment. Um, and I think that's how we get um, you know, chips and science implemented in a way that positions the United States for uh, strategic um, uh, technology uh, development. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Andy. That was, you know, as a semiconductor geek, I think we know a lot of this. And I learn even more when we have these conversations. We've all learned together how critical these are for, for so many things, as you mentioned, during this supply constraint. Uh, but we, we see action moving forward. And uh, thank you for helping us unpack what's being done and uh, what we can do uh, more in the challenge ahead. Uh, we'll have a, a panel upcoming too to talk more about these uh, this broader challenge we face, but I know Glenn has some closing remarks as well and perhaps some perspective too on bipartisan challenges and, and solving them. Thank you, Dan. I, I just wanted to add my thanks to our, our panelists for a very interesting discussion today. 
Um, I, I do find it, it very interesting whether or not you like <clears throat> the term industrial policy, the notion that we figure out whether we want to emulate how other countries do it or more likely just craft a uniquely American model, leveraging uniquely American uh, capabilities and innovations. Uh, we do need to figure out how to coordinate better in terms of um, public and private sector. The great thing about the United States is that our economy produces some of the best innovations, puts them to market oftentimes um, more quickly than many of our other competitors, but we need to be very thoughtful about when roadblocks uh, are allowed to develop and how we can work together to remove them. I deeply appreciate <clears throat> Andy and Diane's thoughts having, as we discussed, worked on the Hill and then worked in other government agencies in the private side um, on how we can continue to coordinate best and also um, very much appreciative of Becky's participation. It, it has always been a very important element of <clears throat> CSPC methodology to work in both a bipartisan way, but also to bring together friends from government and from the uh, private sector, the people who are actually creating innovative products and marketing them and dealing with the challenges that exist in the marketplace to ensure that we are reflecting appropriately on what they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and um, find ways that we can set them up um, for greater success. And we appreciate that, Becky, our, our partnership with you on that. So with that, Dan, let me just turn it over to you. I know we're gonna tee up our, our next um, panel for our next hour, but it's been an amazing conversation so far, tremendously insightful and looking forward to uh, what our next panelists have to add. Yes, we're actually right at the uh, at the top of the hour. So just stretch as you are in your chairs and we'll get on to our uh, our next panelists. If uh, Cleet and Sarah could turn on their, their video and, and join the conversation, I invite uh, our first round panelists. If you want to stay around, please feel free to do so. We'll just have your, your video off. But uh, if, if there's Sarah joining us as well. Um, yeah, I'm excited for this, this second conversation we're going to be having here. Uh, looking at the broader landscape of technology competition and innovation leadership, um, Cleet uh, has had experience serving as the Deputy Assistant to the President for International Economics and Deputy Director of the National Economic Council as part of the National Security Council, uh, has served as a key negotiator with foreign governments and bodies, uh, China, the European Union, uh, the, our partners and friends in the UK, Korea, Japan, and members of the G7, G20, and APEC, among others, and experience litigating in front of the, uh, the World Trade Organization. Uh, Sarah Stewart is the Executive Director of the Silverado Policy Accelerator, uh, which I'm, I'm jealous of. We describe ourselves as a think tank, but an accelerator sounds uh, so much better for, for policy. So uh, the Silverado Policy Accelerator. Um, he also joins us, though, with experience as an international trade lawyer, trade policy expert and negotiator. Uh, you've led the public policy efforts at uh, Amazon on US policy trade and export controls, um, and also have been the deputy assistant uh, USTR for environment and natural resources uh, during your stint in government, but also have uh, worked on negotiations with US-Mexico-Canada agreement, uh, the TTIP with the European Union, and quite a few other roles in the private sector as well. So. Two uh, great folks here joining us on this conversation on the broader innovation competition, the, the challenges we face and how uh, Washington is responding to this. Um, Cleet, I know when we, we talked about this, the one of the things we, we discussed is how interesting it is to see what, what started in your tenure has continued, that in many ways there were, we see such stark partisan differences but on this issue of our competitiveness, of facing the innovation challenge, we've seen a, a, a common current between administrations. We've seen a common thread through Congress. And if you could share your experience in, in implementing that and how you see that moving forward from, from the outside in ways. Sure, and, and thanks for the opportunity to, to participate in this in this great event. I, I appreciate that very much and look forward to, to talking to everyone today. Um, Dan, I think I think you're absolutely correct here. 
in that in many respects, when it comes to technology competition and in particular technology competition with China, there is very little daylight between Democrats and Republicans and between the last administration and, and this one. And I think that you know people may articulate the challenge in slightly different ways, but I, and, and there may be nuances in the various policies that they propose and what they emphasize, but I think that there is um, the same underlying goal, which is um, there's a lot of concern about China's industrial policies, uh, about China's trade practices, and how those have affected existing technologies, and really then how are they going to affect um, emerging technology? And, and, and there's a feeling that we need to be doing more. And I think, you know, you just had a long conversation about semiconductors, and I think that that is obviously seen as one of the key um, areas of competition, but there are others. And I've been watching in, in recent weeks um, as the White House has really seemingly started to consolidate about around what I would say are sort of five core technologies and where I expect most of this conversation to go in, in the next um, couple months. I mean, semiconductors already, but artificial intelligence and quantum computing are seen, I think, right up there with semiconductors as sort of the next frontier. Um, and, and you're also seeing uh, folks in Congress, Republicans and Democrats, saying those same three, I think, are sort of the leading edge. And then you're starting to see biotech and clean energy right, right on their heels. And I look at the CFIUS EO that came out last week. It listed those five areas. You look at Jake Sullivan's speech from last week. It listed those five areas. You look at the legislation that Congress passed. It listed those five areas. There were a few more as well. But I mean, those five, I think, are where we really want to watch policymaking um, in the near term. Um, and I'll let Sarah jump in so I don't consume all this. I have other opinions on the good ways and bad ways to do that and, and happy to opine on that. But again, I, I, I agree with your fundamental point that there is consistency. They're very focused. I think both the Hill, Republicans, Democrats, the administration on semis. And then I think those other four areas are kind of the next the next tranche. Mm -hmm. Sarah, your thoughts on what you, you see in these common threads? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And I'd, I'd love to, you know, uh, play devil's advocate, but I, I really do agree with, with Cleet and, and his comments. I guess I would say a, a couple of additional points. I think that the conversation about industrial policy is really interesting. Um, when we formed Silverado Policy Accelerator less than two years ago, we were thinking about what are the, you know, pillar areas that we want to coalesce around. And, you know, we chose one of them to be trade and industrial security um, because, you know, we could see this, you know, um, this conversation that on both sides of the aisle about what do we do here? I mean, we've, we've done industrial policy in the past. Uh, it's had mixed results, um, but we see, you know, not just our competitors and our allies engaging in industrial policies, but also our adversaries. And I think that there's a lot of notes that we can be taking um, on how we can do it and, you know, how we can do it better. Um, we just heard a great panel discussion on, on semiconductors and you know, I, I think it's a really good starting point. I think we have to get that right uh, if we want to think about where the future of an industrial policy can go to support, you know, our efforts in some of these other areas, whether it's AI or solar or nuclear or, 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 or quantum. We, you know, there's there's some interesting data that's out there showing that the United States, by and large, has fallen far short of its competitors in terms of federal investment in R&D, um, and that we had a steady decline of federal investment in, in R&D for basically 60 years, uh, so as, as, a share of, as a share of GDP. So I think as we enter this new era and we're starting to see the CHIPS Act and the Inflation Reduction Act and, and other investments in particular sectors, I think it's a reflection of new challenges 
and a, a different way of, of, of doing things. I also think it's really important because there's, there's data showing that where federal dollars flow, private yeah. dollars tend to follow. So it'll be, you know, something for us to be watching uh, whether or not, you know, some of the investments that we're making in chips and other sectors jumpstarts private investment. So those are just a couple of the additional observations that that I have. And, you know, I'd love to dive in in, in any yeah. one of those or get more detail, but just off the top. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, sort of the first area I think where we can take this is we talk about you know, we're no longer shy about using the word industrial policy as we once were, but we're also trying to craft a an American version of it in some ways that we don't want to out China, China, nor do we see the, uh, you know, Lilliputian tying down Gulliver model that the EU seems to favor. How do, how do you, uh, how do you look at ways to, you know, how do we build this U.S. model in ways? Some of it is the, the tricky art of legislating where we need to put down stuff perhaps on data or or you know build further policies on on chips or these technologies but how do we how do we craft that to reflect our our values cleat how do you how do you do that in a way that is not you know following yeah. those models that we know around the world well dan you you just used one of my favorite phrases which is you know let's not become china to try to beat china and and i don't mm -hmm. think that's the right way to go and I thought Sarah made some, some great introductory remarks. And, and one of the things that she said that I want to pick up on was, was the focus on R&D. And I mean, I think if you look at the CHIPS legislation, you know, there really are two big pieces of it, right? You have the manufacturing grants, which are important, you know, both for the legacy and for the advanced technologies. That's helpful. That's important. And, and then you have the R&D. And I think the R&D portion of this is largely sort of under-discussed and undervalued in this conversation. Because when it comes to sort of manufacturing grants, again, I think they're helpful, but there's probably only so much we can do. And I think we have to be realistic about how much money we're able to throw out there on technology after technology after technology and, and, and what that's going to do compared to what China is doing or what other of our, our competitors and even allies are doing. Um, and, and I think on R&D, as Sarah said, you really do have the, the, the potential to catalyze additional investment. And then if some of these things uh, do yield technology breakthroughs, you have a huge benefit. So it's not just trying to add more production in one area. It's really creating a catalyst for a much broader uh, innovation revolution. And so I really do think the R&D part of this is probably a little bit undervalued and, and under discussed. The second point I do want to make, and this is, I think, critical as we are thinking about how to do this in an American way, is I don't think we want to rely on subsidies alone, whether it is R&D or, or grants or whatever. It has to be seen in the broader context of both a broader domestic strategy and an international one. And then the domestic side, um, I think it's really important that in addition to putting money out the door in targeted ways, we're really looking at the broader suite of policies in the United States when it comes to tax policy, when it comes to regulatory policy, and making sure that those are competitive. And I and I don't think we're doing enough of that at the, at the current moment. And so I'd like to see that to complement um, the subsidies, because that all is part of industrial policy. How do we make our industry more competitive? And then when it comes to international, I, I do think there's there's really two components that I would highlight. The one that gets a lot of attention right now in the press we're talking about outbound investment screening and export controls. And look, that stuff is important when it comes to national security sensitive technologies. But I think it needs to be done first, firstly in a targeted way where we are not um, restricting the export of products uh, that don't raise those concerns because we have to recognize that when we're selling those products to China, that is funding our innovation at home. So we can put the Chinese consumer and the Chinese business in the position of subsidizing American innovation. And so we wanna be targeted with those. We wanna do it with allies, because if we do it alone, um, it's probably not gonna be effective and, and it's just gonna cost us market share to our, to our competitors. So I think again, being smart and targeted on the restrictions. And the last point I'll make is just, if we are going to start to get into the policy of restricting what our companies can do in China, we need to be giving them opportunities to replace uh, 
that's those sales with other markets. And where I will be a little bit critical of this administration, where I think they aren't pushing enough uh, on is opening markets for U.S. companies through real trade agreements. Mm -hmm. And so especially if their position, and this is what you hear from Jake Sullivan, if their position is in certain areas, you're going to do less business in China, we need other markets to make up for that. And I haven't seen that. So my point here is industrial policy is all well and good. And, and, and the subsidies are all well and good, but it has to be bar, part of a bigger picture if it's ultimately going to be successful for America. And I, I want to put a pin and a point on that trade because I, I have some questions about, you know, in, Indo-Pacific Economic Forum, what we're seeing there. And some of the questions on the trade side of, as the, the Scholl chair put it at CSIS, where's the beef, uh, as he, he said on, on some of the trade side. But but Sarah, too, the, the thought on your thoughts on what we're discussing in this, uh, you know, the new realizations of, of how this American policy is being crafted. Yeah, I mean, I, I like I said, I think that we can take some notes on what our, our allies and our adversaries have done here. Um, you know, having a, a policy of industrial subsidies that is you know, going after uh, undercutting others in the global market in unfair ways. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that as a note that I want to follow. Um, but adopting a holistic strategy is, as Cleet noted, where you're not just looking at how are, how is the government going to be, you know, investing in new manufacturing capacity, but how is the government going to also be supporting the talent that we need to support that new capacity? How is the government going to help incentivize other um, elements of supply chains, whether we're talking about chips or otherwise, to be more diversified and resilient? Um, and, you know, to the point of, 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 of the protection side of this. Look, if we're gonna be spending billions of dollars of taxpayer dollars, um, we've got to be also smart about how we protect those dollars. So we need a holistic strategy at home, but we need a holistic strategy externally. And, you know, Cleet mentioned a few of the things. I, I really do believe that you know, there is targeted outbound investment, export controls, and potentially even tariffs as necessary that are going to help us protect the dollars that we are, you know, trying to inject. There's nothing worse that we could see than five years from now, headlines that say, we wasted $52 billion. We don't have much to show for it. China has advanced. Competitors have advanced. I mean, we've got to be smart about this. We've got to balance expediency of getting money out the door with targeted uh, allied actions that protect that investment uh, externally. Um, and I think, you know, one last, one last point, and I think Cleet raises a really important, important point here. If we are going to restrict trade or technology transfer to other countries, um, we've got to think about what does that mean for U.S. producers at home? So one of the things that we've been, that we've been looking at at Silverado is all of the announced private and public uh, uh, investments in new manufacturing capacity for semiconductors. And, uh, you know, it, and it's not a perfect analysis because there's not a, all of the public data that we need, but what we can find, it shows that including the United States, there's about $1.2 trillion uh, of investment that's going to be out there across, across many, many countries. And, there is demand, at least in the logic sector, that we see only continuing to grow. And so we need to be looking at that from our government's perspective and saying, like, how can we be working with our allies here to be opening up these market opportunities so that if we find that for national security reasons, we need to restrict things like uh, uh, like uh, uh, semiconductor equipment, which has been in the news lately, then where are those equipment makers turning? Um, and I think that there's real market opportunities mm -hmm. to be had. And I think it's a, it's, it, it's critical that we be looking at those and working with our partners on it. 
That's a that's a good point. I want to get into that further because you've worked in negotiations with allies and partners, and sometimes those can be harder than negotiations uh, with adversaries. Um, but how do we do this in a way where you talk about that worst case scenario five years from now, and I imagine it would be one where we've we've been beggar thy neighbor with the Europeans, the Japanese, the Koreans. We haven't coordinated comparative advantages or coordinated responses. And how do we avoid, and Sarah, I'll ask you this first and, and plead for your thoughts. How do we avoid an environment where we've been fighting amongst friends while China has been behind its own wall uh, building its strengths? Well, this is this is the million dollar question. <laughs> Or fifty uh, billion dollar question. The fifty, yeah, exactly <laughs> the fifty billion dollar question. Um, you know, in in a in a rational world, I'd like to say that you know you can band together with your allies against sort of common concerns or you know common issues that you see. Um, and I think that we will see part of that. I think we're already seeing some of that play out, um, whether it's on semiconductors or clean technology or or, or other things. Um, but you're right. It is a it is a, a a spectrum of competing priorities. So, for example, looking at the uh, recently semi-announced Chips for Alliance, which includes the U.S., Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, we all can band together there. Um, with a common objective of, you know, wanting to be more globally competitive and to withstand, you know, risks to supply chains. But we all have some pretty different um, um, risk profiles that we're looking at. I mean, is South Korea, you know, going to be in the same position as the U.S. to take strong action against China if it sees fit? What about Taiwan? Uh, you know, who's already facing aggression from, from China. So I think as we have to do the ally building and we have to try to find common ground because we've got strength in numbers, but we also have to realize that the objectives and the risk profile that we have in the U.S. is not necessarily the same tolerance that our friends have. And we've got to find a way to break through some of that. Look, I'm going to jump right in, Dan, because I think this is an yeah. excellent point to build off of. And 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 I think Sarah is right. There are very different risk profiles. And um, that is, in my opinion, why something like friend shoring, as opposed to trying to do everything at home, is so important. Because at the end of the day, if if countries, whether it's Korea or it's Taiwan or it's someone else, you know, are going to take action that could potentially disrupt some of their market access to China, they need to know that there are going to be alternatives there that are going to be beneficial to them. So essentially, I'm saying, what is the carrot that they actually have in order for them to make that tough decision that they too are going to shut off some of the national security sensitive exports to China? And that's why at the end of the day, I hate to say this, I hate to be critical, I think at the end of the day, that's why IPATH is not going to be successful, is because without something like market access that really gives a carrot to these other countries, they just don't have the economic incentive um, to, to take tough action on China and to reduce their reliance on China. I think this is really, Taiwan is, is a perfect example where I think this conversation is going to play out in mm -hmm. the next couple of months. And I was looking at the figures the other day. Taiwan is 60%, 60 percent of its trade is with China. Mm -hmm. And so what does that mean? That means China ha can coerce them economically. If Taiwan gets out of line, China can just crack down. And, and, and when 60% of your trade is reliant on one market, that is a very effective tool that we have given to China. So I think we need to look at how are we expanding trade ties with Taiwan? How are we expanding mm -hmm. market access incentives with Taiwan in order to help them stand independently and freely against that kind of coercion? Mm -hmm. And that's where I really want to see this agenda go. And so we can all say it's great. Let's all coordinate with friends and allies. But in order to make that effective, we need to think about what are the incentives we are providing to make that viable mm -hmm. for them to actually do it. And that's where, you know, again, I think the administration has talked a pretty good game about working with allies. But I think where myself and others have been critical is saying, where's the market access component to actually make that work? And, and so that's what I would really like to see more out of this administration. 
Mm -hmm. No, a good point. Yeah, the uh, as I cited the the where's the beef question that was asked about this, and uh, you know, interesting to see how we fill that in and how the administration. You know, I, I understand you're critical, but how can you know acknowledging the political window that they have in a uh, you know Congress's own uh, heartburn when it comes to trade? What can we do to maximize the the art of the possible? They they've talked about the environmental. Uh, and labor things, although those are even, you know, for me, I see that as that's making it harder for those countries too. So what do we, what do we highlight that we can make the best out of this? Yeah, Dan, look, I'll be equal opportunity, both critical yeah. and, and compliments. Yeah. I feel like this administration deserves credit for a lot of stuff, right? I do like the fact that they are trying to come up with a versatile Indo-Pacific strategy that has some elements of it that are tailored to each individual country and they're, and they're sort of um, their um, their own status of economic development. I think that's very creative. I think they've done a better job um, than than my administration in sort of <laughs> avoiding picking fights on, on certain issues. I mean, there's some other areas maybe where they're having more trouble recently, but look, I think they're definitely trying. So I give them credit for that. But you'd make a good point, which is I do think you Congress is also a factor here. And there is some skepticism in Congress about trade agreements from the left and the right. Um, you do definitely have a growing sort of more populist, nationalistic streak within the Republican Party that we need to deal with. Um, but look, I think it's doable. And, and I go back to, remember this agreement called NAFTA that was super controversial and all of our jobs were going away to Mexico and like, uh, you know, you know what we did? We said, okay, there are some issues that need to be addressed. We renegotiated it. And it was an agreement that passed with some of the strongest bipartisan support that we have seen ever for a trade agreement. And to me, that's the model. And that's the rubric that I would like to see applied to the Indo-Pacific and to this other agreement that you might remember called TPP. Mm -hmm. um, totally legitimate to say TPP is flawed. It would have in some ways been against our economic interests. But the answer is not to say, let's ignore it and let China write the rules of the road in the Indo-Pacific and let China lower its tariffs with everyone in the Indo-Pacific. We need to get in the game. And so what I would love to see is for this administration and this U.S. Congress to basically do to TPP what we did to NAFTA, which is fix it, make it better, and make it viable for the United States. And I, I think that can there is a model there, and I would love to see that applied to a lot of other countries as well. Um, last point I'll make is I, I do think folks should be watching right now what is a very interesting phenomena, which is that there is growing interest right now in the U.S. Congress in, in, in a Taiwan trade agreement. I mm. think there's potential for a Kenya trade agreement. I'd like to think that's not where it stops. Um, but, 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 but I do think we are at a moment in time where we haven't had an offensive trade agenda for two years, and maybe we are starting to get to an inflection point where people see that value. And I, and I, I really hope mm -hmm. so, because I think we could do it in a way that satisfies the demands of the right and the left. Well, it also seems to be a recurring issue that pulls the public very different from the politicians and their base. When you look at the generally widespread support we see for trade and trade deals uh, among the public, once we see the see the benefits of them, um, you know, that said, too, though, how do we, um, you know, look at, as you said, China writing the rules? How do we write some of our own rules? One of the things that has, you know, been cited is that the U.S. doesn't have a, a data privacy rule. What are, you know, in the absence of a U.S. example, what can we do to, uh, you know, promote some of these areas, you know, beyond just the ties we have with these countries of shared values? I think there's, there's, other ways we need to be more uh, direct in what we, we say on those. Do you agree? I don't know if that's for me or for Sarah. Oh, sorry for you, Cleet. You know, we're, <laughs> we, you know, we're not, you know, I was not... going to let her. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, so I think you're right, right? And I think not having a unified domestic policy does make it more challenging for us to, to push forward. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe on, on the other hand, you could say it gives us more flexibility to explore different ideas internationally. But I'll, I'll make one point that probably isn't going to be helpful to anyone, but I think it's true, which is we need to figure out what we're doing domestically, right? I think, I think USMCA is a rare example where the two parties came together. Mm -hmm. The CHIPS Act is a rare example where more or less the two parties came together. 
we're not doing that enough. And, and we need to get our own whole house in order and figure out how not to politicize everything and actually get things done. The right and the left all think we need to do more on privacy, but mm. we just haven't had the political climate to have those conversations, to have regular order uh, lawmaking. And I, I don't know that I have a suggestion <laughs> other yeah. than to say <laughs> it's a problem. And if we're gonna beat China, <laughs> to put it bluntly, we need to get our own house in order too. Uh, so Sarah, over to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I actually, I, I want to build off of this, but I want to take it in, in a direction that, you know, is, is near and dear to me, which is on the environment side of the house. Um, not that data privacy isn't, uh, isn't top of mind, but um, one of the things that we've been spending a lot of time on is, you know, looking at uh, how the U.S. is faring uh, on a global on a global sort of trade basis, um, but also a competitiveness basis when it comes to emissions. And we've got some of the cleanest manufacturing in the world here in the United States, and we're importing about uh, uh, thirty percent of our carbon emissions come from imports. Uh, and so we've got to be thinking about that, but we don't have a domestic uh, carbon price. And, you know, we have yet been able, unable to find any convergence on a bipartisan basis about what do we do about all of this? So, you know, one of the areas that I think we're going to see a lot more discussion on is do we use a carbon border adjustment to try to level the playing field? Um, and, you know, is that something that domestic companies are going to face as well, or are we just going to look at the import side? So I think that could be an interesting, um, you know, trade issue to, to watch. Part and parcel of that is, you know, in, in, in spending a lot of time looking at, at climate issues and semiconductor issues, one of the other things that became evident to us very early on is there are some serious import dependencies that we have on the critical minerals, gases, chemicals, other things that are needed. Um, mm -hmm. If we're going to be serious about, you know, making sure that we have all of this new chips manufacturing capacity at home, if we take steps to cut off China or to, you know, increase our export controls, there's a real chance that they retaliate by cutting us off from things that we need mm -hmm. for semiconductors, but also for clean technologies. And to put a finer point on this, uh, one of the areas that, that we're looking at as everybody is looking to the IPAF and I, and I, and I hope that that's successful, but one of, the, one of the areas that we're looking at is in our own backyard, uh, Latin America. We mm -hmm. have a very resource rich set of countries that we already have free trade agreements with. Uh, that already share our values um, and have a lot to offer to us when we're talking about clean technology transition and, and other things. And yet we have China encroaching day by day uh, into you know, buying up the mines and the mineral rights and then extracting the cobalt and nickel and lithium that we could be, you know, we could be sort of having more virtuous relationship with these countries with, they're extracting it and exporting it back to China. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, right, um, right. Yeah, you know, yeah. all of these things are interconnected. And, you know, this is all to say we need a domestic and in international strategy that looks at all of this, that looks at the trade, the investment the federal investment at home, the protections of all of that and how all of these things connect. Because you know, doing a piecemeal approach uh, is, is not going to end up being successful for us. And you mentioned the environment, you raised that and the, it's a, you talked about the critical supply chains and, and for minerals we talk about with batteries and we saw some of that in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, specifically looking at Critical minerals. It was, but a, a topic that was raised uh, with past administration with the Quad beginning to work on coordinating these these critical supply chains. So, one, how do how do we do that with others? And and since you raised the environment, uh, Sarah, do you 
agree with this concern that the Huawei model is being applied to green energy tech by China, the, the underselling, the undercutting of solar, of wind, of that infrastructure that the, the same playbook they use with telecom we're seeing with green tech and we need to recognize that faster. Do you agree with that concern? I 1000% do. Um, one of the things that, that, we, that we've looked at is we looked at uh, a grouping of the you know, most uh, foundational clean energy technologies and environmental technologies. And China is a net exporter of those technologies and it is not consuming those technologies. So what does that tell us? <laughs> it tells us that they are not taking on the commitments to using and deploying those technologies in their own country to cut emissions, but they are committed to gaining as much market share as they can in the international market um, with these technologies. And, you know, we've seen it with solar and, and others and lots of times undercutting, uh, you know, prices that you would see coming out of the, you know, same, same products for us or EU mm -hmm. produced uh, technology. So I do think it's, I do think it's a real issue. And, and so for addressing that, you know, we look at the, the ways we can use trade tools, but also so much of this seems to be a competition for the marketplace in the global South. We talked to, you mentioned Latin America, uh, Cleet, you talked about a U.S. Kenya trade deal as a, as a potential jumping off point for more, but how do we continue to reorient our thinking away from just access to the China market as the end all and be all and more competing for growth in those markets and and understanding their demand for leapfrog technologies, not necessarily what what we want to apply. Yeah. Well, look. Let me just say first of all, I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone, or well, at least I'm not advocating. I hope Sarah's not advocating. You know that we're going to give up on the on the on the China market. I mean, I, I still mm -hmm. think the China market provides valuable growth opportunities for our our, our companies. Perhaps we have to approach it in, in in more of a sort of managed way, where you know we're not selling everything there, but we are continuing to sell things um, that are more commoditized in nature. Don't raise national security concerns, because again, at the end of the day, that is innovation money for our companies, and and it's good for us. Um, but I think a theme, and, and Sarah got at this in her comments as well, and I think we come back to this notion of diversification of markets you know, friend shoring and working more with, with allies and partners. I mean, that clearly needs to be to be part of the strategy. And I do think we need to take a, a long, hard look at both trade agreements with these regions. So, you know, I, I mentioned Kenya, I think in, in Latin America, you know, I think taking a hard look at Brazil is worthwhile. I mean, there was some momentum in that direction during the Trump administration. I'd like to, to revisit that. I also think we need to think about our development finance tools and using them in a more strategic way. That was some of the impetus behind the Build Act, which you know modernized OPIC and created DFC. Um, I'm a little concerned that um, we haven't been really implementing that in the way that we had hoped. Um, either sort of you know we haven't really sourced huge deals in strategic ways with other allies and partners in strategic locations, and and I'd like to see that as a much bigger part of our um, sort of geostrategic arsenal uh, than it has been to date. And then let me just comment uh, on one thing Sarah said that I think is interesting, it, it, not to take our conversation back, but I, but, I, but I think it's important to focus for a moment on the sort of the whole carbon border adjustment mechanism. And, and I think that this is something that has more traction in the Republican party than you might imagine. You've started to hmm. see comments here and there about it. Uh, and I do think some people are attracted to it as a competitiveness tool. I think I think it needs to be designed in a way that it's both a competitiveness and a climate tool. And really, to the extent it's a competitiveness tool, it's really just about leveling the playing field and making sure that we don't enter into trade wars with other countries because we all do our own version of carbon border adjustment mechanism. But I really would like to see the negotiations and the conversations on that advance faster um, so we can get out ahead of that one. Because I, I think... 
I think it's the right thing to do. I'm a little concerned though, that if we don't coordinate it well and, and, and do it in a constructive way, you know, it could yield a trade war. And the one really challenging piece, I think we have to have a real conversation about this is what is the domestic price? And uh, mm -hmm. I know that's tough uh, for some and, and some are worried that then that gets applied in a way domestically that's gonna hurt our competitiveness. But I don't think you can do it without that, at least not in a sort of a WTO credible way. And so I, I think we need to just have that conversation and see where it leads us. Sarah, where do you think that conversation would go? Do you think there is a, a, a an opportunity perhaps there that we can, if we do emphasize the environment and, and green policy as an area of geostrategic competitiveness rather than just uh, uh, green policy, that there is an opportunity? I, I absolutely do. Um, it's an area that we're working on um, really closely, totally agree with, with Clee. It's kind of amazing to see, um, you know, who has been supportive on this on both sides of the aisle. Um, definitely critical that we get it right. Uh, from Silverado perspective, uh, you know, we've we've looked really closely at the carbon advantage that the U.S. has in a lot of manufacturing sectors, and I think our view is that both politically and because it's the right thing to do, that you know we would focus a, if 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 this comes to pass, it would focus on imports and not adding extra burden uh, to domestic producers. I think you can, a price is one way to go for sure. I think you can develop a set of national averages for different sectors that could work as well in terms of carbon intensity and performance standard. But a lot of that is technical in the weed stuff that our policymakers haven't quite wrapped their heads around yet. I think there's a lot of conceptual convergence that you know, we are by and large, you know, following stricter environmental standards. And inherently that means that we have higher costs of production because of that. And that that puts us at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis our competitors and adversaries who are not following those same high standards. This is like, you know, one of the things that we've worked on for years as far as trade policy goes and it, you know, applies equally here. So, you know, what do you do about it? Um, because it is complicated mm -hmm. <laughs> and you don't want to, 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 to um, you know, to add burden. Uh, to to domestic producers, but you want to incentivize the decarbonization, and you want to hit the highest emitters. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we'll 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 see. But I think that this is a conversation to watch, and we want to get it right. Um, this is a question came in from my colleagues, and I think builds on your comments. And perhaps because you said those five words, Sarah, the right thing to do. Um, how, um, Cleet, I'll, I'll ask you first, and previous year during your administration we started to raise the issues of hong kong human rights the uyghurs we were in ipef we're talking about labor standards and environment as well how important is you know even if we can't uh, necessarily do the trading the the moral argument and making that to the world uh as we look at china's behaviors china's actions uh and and, and building coalitions in ways yeah Look, I think it matters some places more than others. And, and I think that it does have the potential to attract others uh, into you know, looking at similar policy approaches. And I think it's helpful to us in many respects. I, I think it can help draw a contrast with what's going on in, in, in China um, that can be beneficial and, and, and really painting for, for different countries, you know, what is the view of the world that you want to see moving forward? Is it one that is aligned with freedom and democracy and, and, and those kinds of values, or is it one that is more aligned with uh, authoritarianism and censorship and issues like that? And, and I think we can win that, that argument. I will say, though, that on the nuances of it and, and in specific policy areas, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're keeping our own house in order to be credible 
and and I worry about some of the actions we've sort of taken as of, of late, right? I mean, we make a big deal about China needing to play by the rules and not discriminate against other countries. And, you know, and oftentimes we find ourselves sort of falling in that trap ourselves. And so I, I think it's important that that we find a way, um, you know, look, I, I think the argument resonates, but we need to be credible, you know, and 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 in and, and the way that we proceed. And the one I'm just been on my mind recently, and it's a little bit different than authoritarianism and free speech, et cetera, mm -hmm. but it's sort of the, when you're looking at the issue of, you know, lecturing others on the importance of not discriminating and following the rules, I look at like the electric vehicle tax credit is just a total sort of own goal. You know, I mean, just, it, it, we didn't need to design it that way. Um, it was, you know, kind of done behind closed doors and foisted upon the administration and they may not love it either, but it's just, those kinds of things just don't help. You know, when we, we tell countries like Korea and the EU, we need to work together to reduce reliance on Chinese supply chains. And then we just, just have a discriminatory standard that's only North America. I mean, it just, it just, it just undermines ourselves. And so I think those moralistic arguments um, of both human rights and authoritarianism and playing by the rules, I think all of them matter and they can be persuasive, but we need to stop from, from you know, undermining ourselves as well. Um, another question from a colleague, and I also invite our, our audience to uh, to submit to the Q&A as well, uh, any questions that they might have. Uh, but what, uh, Sarah, with the importance of workforce and getting the right people, you know, we've talked about it in R&D, but even, um, you know, if we stand up some of these bodies in government to review investment, you know, are there enough accountants and, you know, some of these government jobs that need to be put into place? Uh, are we having the, the right talent pool throughout this uh, for the challenge we face? And what can policymakers do about that? I mean, if 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 you have a good answer, let me know. Okay. <laughs> yes. uh, I mean, it, this is this is so important. Um, it is so important that we have the right talent in the government to help implement policies, but also the right talent in the private sector mm -hmm. to help, you know, uh, move us forward and, you know, ensure that we are actually innovating. And I see them as having two potentially different solution sets, mm -hmm. um, but they could also be symbiotic. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of talent that we have in the private sector and having worked in the government and then moving from the government directly to the private sector, um, I can tell you that one of the biggest draws is, is salary. Um, and I mean, not to, you know, not to be cute, but it is, you know, as, as, as you get more experience and you are able to, you know, contribute more to your field, um, your value, you know, goes up. And so I think we've got to think through how we're going to get the best engineers and the best talent and the best accountants, et cetera, um, you know, to feel like the service that they may provide in, in government, whether it's long or short, is worthwhile. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure exactly how we incentivize that. Uh, maybe it's through some system of secondment or, or you know, uh, kind of revolving doors, but those come with those come with downsides as well. Uh, but certainly, you know, in, incentivizing incentivizing that I think is key. And then, you know, then there's also the issue of of talent in our in our companies and our engineering base, and you know, making sure that we are providing. Um, the, you know, comparable incentives to, you know, to other countries. And I think that we do. I think that our rule of law system is in itself an intangible um, that, you know, should, should incentivize workers to come here. But, you know, of course, we know about a uh, thousand talent program, you know, from China and, and others that, you know, we're just not going to, to engage in that kind of thing here. Uh, and so, you know, we're going to lose some, some talent that way, but that's another, that's another really key area looking to, you know, our universities and other policies to make sure that we are attracting global talent and to, uh, you know, incentivizing a domestic talent pipeline. 
Oh, certainly, and and I think too we uh, challenging as it would be to bring up in an in an, in an election year immigration, and as you say, bringing that. Uh, Notice that, I that didn't count. use the the I word. I'll I'll use it as the host. <laughs> I'll I'll touch that third rail, and you know I don't have much hair to stand on end. So, uh, with that though, um, you know I see we're we're winding down, and I don't see too many other questions from the audience. So. I, I will give back some folks their time to, to commute and get home today, but I want to thank uh, Cleet and Sarah for their time for a, a great conversation, uh, having, having learned so much about these topics, and I, I hope to have you all back very soon to, to discuss more. I think we'll have a lot to talk about with the, with the new Congress wanting to tackle this, so uh, thank you, and, and any closing thoughts you, you'd like to share? Just that it's been great to be on with you, and I enjoy the conversation. And if we have to touch third, fourth, and fifth rails, let's do it, because we need to have open and honest conversations about how to make good policy around here. So Great. Thanks. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, thank you to our friends also at the George Mason University National Security Institute for their help in, in publicizing this. We've had quite a few of their fellows and senior fellows on these panels as well. So always a pleasure to work with them. Thank you for joining us live. For those of us joining on our YouTube, we hope you're well and enjoyed this conversation. Take care, everyone.